our our house. As good as it gets. All right. So I am Daniel Emerico. I'm from the Sickets Hospital downtown Toronto, and uh, I'm lucky enough to be the manager of the informatics facility at the Center of Applied Genomics, which uh, does a, a range of data analysis services, uh, NGS data, array data, uh, and this is distilled from our experience sifting through variants and trying to capture which ones are more important, which we do more on the uh, research side of our activities. Uh, so here I have a nice capture of a few of the tools and ideas that we will go through. Um, objectives for today. So I have detected somatic variants in a cancer sample or in a cell line uh, that was originally from a cancer in your case. What information can I bring in from the world to interpret them and narrow them down to a set that is interesting and potentially biologically actionable? So specifically, we will go through what annotations are available, what do they mean, how do I use them. Then we'll have a specific part on the models to score missense variants. Uh, and in the lab, we will see an annotation tool in action. The name of the tool is Anovar, uh, which is pretty popular in the community. And then we'll take the variant list that you generated from Sprelka, we'll annotate it using Anovar, and we will filter it, and we will get to a few genes that are potentially actionable from so many variants. Right, so a little bit of introduction first. Uh, these are concepts that you may have seen before, and if I'm telling you something different than the other instructors, raise your hand, but we should at least agree on the basics. Um, here I've set, this, this is more about the, uh, the design of cancer studies and how you go about in interpreting the data. And I've, I've identified two cases, small data sets and, and large data sets. So in small data sets, you only have a few subjects or a few cancers that you have sequenced. And in large data sets, you have many. So I said greater than 100 and in the scale 1 to 10. Now, if you have a few, the focus will be more on looking at variants that previ previously reported uh, and then trying to interpret them based on variant information, gene information, and so forth. So this is more similar to what a clinician may do with sequence data for a specific patient that comes in, and then it's more using the sequence data as a diagnostic tool, sort of, right? Or you may have a small study on a specific cancer that's not that common, so you want to try uh, to squeeze it as much as possible out of its biology. But you also have these large data sets, okay, big consortia, uh, doing so many samples of colorectal cancers, medulloblastoma, and so forth. And there you have a much bigger role of statistics so that you can just look at variant frequencies over so many samples, aggregate statistics from the variant to the gene to the pathway, and then rely more on the statistics to identify the potentially interesting variants, although you should never forget the biology, of course, because that eventually has to tie in into a message about what's going on in the cell. So if you wish, what we see today is very useful for this, and it's helpful for this, but it's not the centerpiece. And I will not talk about how you do association statistics at the variant, gene, or pathway level. Okay? So I will focus more on how you bring in as much information as possible on the variant to then interpret it. Uh, the other big distinction you should keep in mind is variant and gene information. Okay? So two levels. The lowest one is the variant, which may be single nucleotide variant, small indel, a deletion, a big copy number change, okay? And then, especially for smaller variants, which will be the one we focus in on, depending on where they are, uh, what type of effect they may on the protein function and so forth, we can classify them. And we can prioritize one versus another one. But the other level that you should always keep in mind is that the same disruptive variant that may rule out one copy of, 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 of the gene product on one gene and on a completely different gene will not have the same biological effect. So there's a lot of information at the gene level that you also have to use when you prioritize variants. I will not go into the details on this, uh, 
you will know more in the lecture that follows me, especially about gene functions and pathways. So I think you've already uh, used the word passengers and drivers. And here, I'm just illustrating how this plays out with what I said before. So if you have a gene that's important, the gene is an activator of the process, controls a key process, and the, that gene is key in that process. Uh, and on top of that, you have a variant that puts it in a permanently active state because it's on a key residue. Then that combination can act as a cancer driver. But you need both pieces, variant level and gene level. You can have an activating variant on a gene that it's not even expressed in that cell, in that system, that will not act as a cancer driver event. And the other case, of course, is you have an important repressor, you have a function that's loss of function, so that protein is not expressed anymore, or it's in, in a status that's permanently inactive, and then you get a driver event. Again, you need the gene and the variant. And you can get any sort of variant over genes that are redundant or not expressed, or they control a process that's not key for cancer. And regardless of the variant, the variant may be in the most conserved residue, but you get no effect. So never forget the gene level, although we don't cover it in this lecture. Okay? This lecture will be more about variants. Um, okay. So also, if you get a variant <laughs> that's in, in a region that's not important, even if the gene is important, it can not affect, of course. So this is just to summarize these three areas of information that I pointed out. Volume frequency, not today. In this product, uh, sorry, uh, the variant will be more in this module, and the gene function pathway more in the next lecture, okay? The other thing to keep in mind is variant sizes. You've probably already discussed because you, you've looked at somatic SMVs. You've looked at uh, somatic copy number variants. This is just a summary uh, of the different variant sizes. We're going to focus on the small or short group, which is from roughly one base pairs to 50 base pairs, or from zero, uh, however you count the lesions. Uh, and so we will focus on SMVs, <coughs> single nucleotide variants, one base pair substitution, relatively easy to detect. Small indels, a bit more challenging to detect, but never bigger than 50 base pairs, typically smaller. Um, and there's plenty of databases for this kind of variants, reporting them, having uh, any link to disease and uh, publications and so forth. And these are typically mapped by exact coordinates, which is what we will do. But you've seen also other types of, uh, of variants uh, in a larger range. Again, insertion, deletions, translocation, complex rearrangements, uh, gene fusions, and so forth. What we see today is not fully applicable to this, although some ideas are in common, uh, because of the size, because of the mapping that cannot be by precise coordinates, because of the type of effect. For instance, an SMV can change a residue within a protein, but if you have a big copy number variant, that is not able to change a residue in a protein. So many logics are a bit different. Okay. Right. So before we dive in, any question? All clear. So this is a summary of what we will go through in detail today. So these are all the variant annotation components we will go through. Okay. First of all, we will look at databases for variants. Uh, first group will be databases with allele frequencies from reference data sets. So they don't have anything to do with cancer, and they're typically germline variants, so variants that are present in all the cells in the individual that don't arise somatically in cancer cells or other cells. The name of these databases that somebody may have already mentioned are the 1000 genome, the NHLBI ESP, and the CGI46. Okay? We'll go through in details what those are, what are the specifics of those databases. How are we going to use this? Well, if these report the frequencies of germline variants, and we're looking at somatic variants, somatic variants should not show up. So we're basically going to use them to throw away variants that are potentially false positives, they're not somatic, they're actually germline. Okay. 
Then we have DiviSnip. That's just a broad scope reference database for small variants. So if something is being reported at some point, polymorphism, germline, somatic, whatever, it may be there. And then Cosmic, that's specifically a database for somatic variants. So the kind of variants that you're interested in being this a cancer workshop. Okay. So these are all databases, collect variants, some levels of annotations, some displays. And the other piece, after we've checked if our variant is in any of these databases and there's usable information that we can pull out, is gene mapping. So human genome has... 20,000 or more genes. Uh, we know a lot about the function of genes, especially the protein coding ones. So these are the key features to look at when you look at the genome. So gene mapping is a centerpiece. And then depending on the different portions that we have within a gene, we can map to the different portions. So for instance, uh, coding region that codes for a protein or another gene product, UTRs, which are transcribed but not translated, and then what's outside. And after we've done the gene mapping, then we can check the type of effect that we have on the protein. So does this alter the protein sequence? Does it change an amino acid? Does it disrupt the translation of the protein from a given point down? Yes. Then we will look at uh, specifically how do we interpret a class of variants that's called missense variants that change amino acids. Okay. Uh, what type of measures we can use to further interpret them. There are other variants that are of easier interpretation, whereas missense variants are more difficult to interpret. They can be very important, but they can be a lot, and it can be difficult to sift through them. And if you don't have any tool, they're just a lot, and they don't apparently mean anything. So that's why we have to spend more time looking at models to score them. Okay. Right, so I'm going to start from allele frequency databases. So as I said, all these databases are done with the following logic. You record the number of individuals, take blood samples or saliva samples or cell samples, sequence them, and then detect variants. And then you get this reference data set on a relatively large population of what are the variants. This design is aimed at germline variants, so variants that are present from birth in all your cells. It's possible that some somatic variant may come up, but that's going to be a very rare event, right? So they're not designed to identify cancer drivers, variants. They're identified just to look at the general variation in the population with different flavors, okay? So if we see a variant coming up in these databases, specifically an allele, uh, with a given frequency, you have detected a somatic SMB, but look what? That allele, that T, that base substitution, actually has a 1% frequency in one of these databases. It's likely an artifact. It's likely not somatic. If it's somatic, it's likely to do nothing because you wouldn't see it in, some, in so many subjects. Okay? So we'll use them as a filter to throw away stuff. And I mean, I've already gone through the names. Start from 1,000 genomes. Okay. Uh, the reason why this project was started was to identify variants that are relatively common in populations, specifically greater than 1% frequency, uh, simply in different ethnic populations. Um, right now, there's about 1,000 subjects that are sequenced and available, and a project completion, it would be 2,500. Is that enough? Well, for that goal, this is a good number. But of course, if we had a million instead of a thousand, we would be much happier, especially for variants that are more unique to specific ethnicities. It was launched in 2007, and the sequencing technology has been really, really progressing fast. So some elements of the design, if you look at them nowadays, they don't make much sense, but you have to think back at the technology they, that was available at the time. Right? So here, I will drink down into a few details. Uh, but I've already said the key concepts, so if you get lost in some of these details, it's not a big deal. Uh, the ethnicities are actually pretty good. There's European, Black African, East Asian, mixed Americans. Some ethnicities are missing, but 
this is one of the best databases in terms of uh, ethnic coverage. Um, why ethnicity is so important, by the way? Well, if I have a variant that's rare but only one ethnicity, and for some reason I mistaken it for a somatic, then if that ethnicity is not well represented, I will not have a good chance of removing it, right? So if your somatic color is not doing a good job and making a lot of mistakes and calling a lot of variants as somatic but they're not, using this database as a key, you're sequencing an exotic ethnicity. This database helps you less. If you sequencing a more mainstream ethnicity, represented ethnicity, this database will do a better job. Okay. Um, yeah, there, right now there's 38 million SNPs. Uh, about 4 million indels, so it's grown very rich. It has a mix of different platforms, so it's not unique to one sequencing platform. And it's a mix of very low coverage whole genome and higher coverage exome. So also where the variants were called in the genome as a hodgepodge of everywhere, almost everywhere in the genome where you can align reads and call stuff and enriching for the, uh, the coding component with an exon capture. So in this uh, course, we will focus on the coding component. But if you're looking outside, keep that in mind. You have less support outside, although you can still get uh, reasonable uh, additive frequencies. And also, they use a mix of different tools for calling uh, variants. I mean, is it a disaster? No. But there are sometimes specific effects related to using one platform or using one caller that if you're using the same platform and the same caller you can have a better chance of seeing the same things or the same artifacts and so you have a better chance of removing them if you're using a completely different platform you say may see something unique and then think it's new but it's just unique to your platform or your pipeline so that's why i'm also mentioning that for reference but as i said it's not a disaster this is a very neat, greedy uh, table showing you all the ethnicities that are present, but it boils down to Europeans, Eastern Asians, uh, Africans with a specific focus on Western, Black Africans, and Mexicans. Right now available, other plan, including Indians and other Southeast Asians and so forth. The next database that we review is the NHLBI ESP. Okay? Um, the goal of this project was not to chart the variation in the general population focusing on healthy individuals like the 1000 genome, <laughs> but the, the goal was to look at disorders that are relatively common in the population, focusing on heart, lung, and blood, right? And then being able to tackle uh, variants that are more rare, that have a low frequencies below 1%, okay? And it has uh, 6,500 subjects. So more than five times more than 1,000 genome, but it has exome technology. So it's very good for the coding regions that were captured. Outside that, it can't tell you anything, unless for some reason part of the introns were captured and so forth. Okay? These are not necessarily healthy individual. For you, it's not a problem because this doesn't capture somatic variants in cancer. It captures people with extreme blood pressure, predisposed to myocardial infections, and so forth. So. You shouldn't see somatic variants here. It doesn't have a cancer. Uh, and the ethnicities, well, the Eastern Asians are completely missing. So if you have a variant that's unique to Eastern Asians, you're not going to see it here. Uh, right now, it's focused on African Americans and European Americans. So it covers very well the Northwestern Cauca European Caucasians and Black Africans. Uh, and again, Illumina platform variant calling again. Uh, it's a little bit of a hodgepodge of different methods. And then the last one that we see is the complete genomics 46 uh, and 69, which are highly related. 46 is the one with uh, unrelated subjects, so it's a subset. Focus on this. Uh, it's not a lot of subjects, okay, but they're whole genome, and they're not on the complete genomics platform. Uh, now, I don't, probably the complete genomics platform was mentioned to you. It's a very nice platform. It comes with sequence data analyzed up to the variants. Um, maybe it's not as spread as Illumina, but it's a very good platform. So it's very helpful to have a database that's specific to that platform. Uh, but again, it's not a lot of subject, although it, it, it 
it's very good with uh, ethnic coverage, right? It includes Indians, for instance. And the, the coverage is also very high, unlike the 1,000 gene. Yes. And this is just a detail of the different ethnicities for these for these six subjects. Okay? So in the final uh, lab, we'll use allele frequencies from all of these databases. Okay. So just a summary of this. Key thing to keep in mind, different ethnic compositions, all genome versus exome. So if you're looking at variants that are not, that are intergenic, for instance, NHLB ISP will not tell you anything, typically. Okay. Uh, different platforms, dif different uh, variant colors, that's a, a minor issue, although if you have complete genomics data, you maybe see variants on in the CGI 46, for instance. Uh, and other, there are more details, more nitty gritty, is that there's different sequencing depth, so different databases, different power for variant at different frequencies. Some of them are designed for the more common ones, some of them are designed for the more rare ones, like the energy of the ISV. Okay, so all these data sets in the end are complementary. You should use all, all three, essentially. The other thing is, these projects get constantly updated. Uh, variant cloning pipeline, pipelines get updated, more subjects get sequenced, even the capture of exons may actually get updated. Some projects may switch from exons to whole genome. So you always have to keep your eyes open and stay tuned for updates and look at how the updates are captured by the annotation tool that you're using. Right? The, do you have any questions so far? When I say allele frequency, is it a concept that's shared by everybody? <laughs> okay. The next component that we're going to look at are the sequence variation databases, DBSNP and Cosmic. Okay. So I'll start from DBSNP. And you may have already uh, heard a lot about. So this is a broad scope repository of variation, and we look at the small components specifically. Okay. Uh, there are other databases in NCBI that are specific for bigger copy number variants, like DBVAR. Uh, some missions came in from the era before NGS and after all these projects derived by NGS. Whereas the project that I showed you before, 1000 Genome, and HLBI, ESP, and CGI 46 are all based on NGS technology, there will be submissions here that date to the Sanger technology, or even before. Okay? There are polymorphisms that you find in the general population with even higher frequencies, and there are things that are more rare. There are somatic variants. There are variants that might not even validate, maybe, that was just submitted, and it's a bit more iffy. So it's basically a reference database of variation that has been surfacing in different studies. So you will find a lot of different things. So don't use it as a filter. If you throw away everything that's in the BSNP, you may throw away very well characterized somatic variants, right? Which have tons of publications attached. Um, and if you want to really get into the plumbing of annotation, there are actually ways of extracting from the BSNP only the component that's not clinically associated. Okay. If you want to use it as a filter, like we did for the other databases, which we will not do in the lab today. <laughs> but I want to mention it's possible. And then the other reference database that we look at is Cosmic, which was probably mentioned before in this uh, Cancer Bioinformatics workshop. Um, it's a catalog of somatic mutation in cancer. So that's what you want to look at if you want to see that your somatic variant has been reported before. Um, so we're going to do the, the matching to cosmic entries. Uh, and really, the key here is to check how many studies and samples it was found in, because it was found only in another one. And you can imagine the support is not that great. If it was found in a thousand others, well, you haven't discovered any new variant, but if you're interpreting just what's going on at the biological level, then you can rest very sure that that variant is interesting, right? And then you can also use it, instead of just looking at the single variant level, you can look at the gene, look how the <laughs> variants are distributed, 
there are hotspots and if there are a lot of variants reported for the gene. Something will not surprise you, like genes like TP53 will have tons of entries. Okay? And here there's a little uh, tutorial on following this variant in these two databases. So this is not a lab session, so don't start clicking on, on your laptop, just follow this, but you have enough details if you want to look at this later so that you, you can follow through all the screenshots. So I just picked this variant, VRAF V600E, as an example, just to be hands-on on one variant. This is very well established in the cancer field. It's actually an activating variant on VRAF, which is in the MAP kinase cascade, driver of growth, proliferation, survival, so forth. Okay? And we'll look at it in deep sleep and cosmic. So I've already mapped it for you to the DBSNP identifier, right? Because otherwise you only have the name of the gene and the position in the protein where you have an amino acid change. Uh, that's not the easiest way to identify a variant, although you can use those in Cosmic. Uh, but DBSNP typically has RS identifiers. And if you have somatic variants that were called by yourself or by somebody else, you start having the genomic coordinates and the gene and the type of amino acid change will be an output of the annotation pipeline. So you can easily trace back to the genomic coordinates and the DBSNP identifier, which we'll see in the lab. You'll have it in the end of our output. So I'm not doing any magic, but taking the DBSNP identifier as a start. So <clears throat> this is the screenshot that you get out of DBSNP. It has a lot of information. But one key thing that we can start focusing on is the fact that you have an area called clinical channel and this is marked up as pathogenic and untested allele. So what happens is that this position, you have the reference, and then you have two alternate alleles. One of them is quite of a passenger, and the other one is pathogenic. And this one is actually the pathogenic one. I'll show you better in the next screenshot. But the key message here is when you put your RAS in the deepest page, and this shows up, it's clinically associated. So it's not... Uh, it's a variant that's being reported to be associated to some extent to disease. So look up for extra information, see how well it's supported. Okay. And if you click on that, you get to a more detailed view of this clinical association report. Okay. The key here is that at this position, we have T as the reference allele, so T nucleotide as the reference allele, and then there's two substitutions that are reported. The pathogenic one is C2C, which produces the V to E amino acid change at position 600 in the protein. And then the other one is maybe somatic, maybe germline. It's pathogenicity and tested. And actually, it's a T2A, which produces a valine to allele change, which intuitively, if you look in the table of the amino acid structure, the valine to alanine doesn't have a big structure of change, but the valine to glutamic acid <coughs> adds a negatively charged group. So we see that the biochemistry actually supports <coughs> what we've seen in the database as reported based on association studies, functional studies, and so forth. So in, this is a case where you can immediately see at the amino acid level, just look at it, that the distinction between the pathogenic and the untested one makes sense. And then if you click on the pathogenic one and you follow that link, you get to another database that I don't have time today to describe in detail, which is called OMEN. And OMEN will give you a lot of information about this variant. But I pulled out a key sentence which says the V600E mutation is an activating mutation resulting in constitutive activation of VRAF and downstream signal transduction in the map kinase path. Malignant melanoma. Boom. There are many other entries, right? So this is a very good example of a driver mutation, driver gene, mutation is activating. The gene is uh, an activator of the process. Okay? So it's not your TP50. TP53 loss of function that removes 
an important repressor or DNA damage response activator. <coughs> and then in Cosmic, I've queried this starting from the gene, putting in BRAF, and then this V600E is one of the first records that you get. Okay. Apologies for the lower resolution in the screen. And then you can look at the cosmic entry and specifically you can see that there are a lot of entries. So a lot of studies that, and samples that have reported it. And you can also see that there's a gigantic column on that position representing all the studies. And then you also, if you look at other variants, there's really a cluster of somatic variation besides this single nucleotide substitution at the same position, and then a few others in the same protein domain. So this is really a key residue. In general, even if you have something that's only reported by a few studies, but then you see clustering in a protein domain, that's also very interesting. Okay. So this is the side of taking a variant, looking it up one by one. Um, we'll see more systematic, of course, in the lab, just taking a big table and then doing a number of filters. So this is just helpful to illustrate how we can take the databases, browse them, what type of information they have. And of course, that information can also be extracted computationally, at least some of it. OK, so the next that we're going to go through is gene mapping. But before that, do you have any questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean that changes within one block are small and across are bigger? That's a good rule of thumb. Okay. But proteins are complex structures, and depending where things are, the outcome may be very different. So if we had protein structures of all the proteins and all the protein isoforms, and we had a good compute cluster doing molecular mechanics, we could go in, change an amino acid, see what happens, assuming that there are no uh, other effects because of that protein binding to other proteins and so forth, which really requires to put the protein in the context. Then we would see that for some, residue, some residues, that are in key positions, are very important for the secondary structure, like for a double helix, or for a beta sheet, or in a catalytic uh, residue, and so forth, or for forming a hydrophobic core. We change the residue, and that destabilizes the protein, or changes the catalytic uh, capability, so it decreases the, the rate of the, of the reaction, right? Unfortunately, we don't have so many protein structures and tools that are that advanced to really do this mechan mechanistic prediction. But usually, if a residue is conserved, and here's a notion that I will describe be better later, and you have a dramatic amino acid change, chances are that change uh, will be disrupted. Although that's based on heuristics, right? The missing scoring models specifically look at the type of amino acid change and use different scoring models to basically predict how disruptive that's going to be. But of course, it's always good to have a transfer model so that you look at the amino acid and you see what it does. Sometimes you can even tie it into uh, biochemical publications, say, uh, done a lot of extensive characterization and can tell you in detail uh, what is the effect. But usually, when you see those dramatic changes from a chain this big, you get a chain this big, or a proline gets inserted or changed into something else, because proline has a particular effect on the structure, a complete polarity change from positive and negative, in general, those are more likely to make a difference. You have a valine uh, to, to glycine or leucine to isoleucine. Sometimes that will make a change, but it's less likely, right? Many people at TCAG in the academic group have that table printed on their desk, so it's useful. <laughs> All right, so I, I usually put it up from uh, Wikipedia. I should print it myself, so I don't keep it. It's on Wikipedia, by the way, so you just Wikipedia amino acid. So the other thing is the gene mapping. Um, okay. 
that we're going to go through next. Uh, so you may be picky and say, well, why only genes, right? Somebody will already say it's already complicated enough. <laughs> but somebody else may be very ambitious and say, I don't want genes only. I want everything, right? We're discovering so many things about the genome, like there's ANCODE. Well, <laughs> besides the fact that we have only two hours today, um, genes are really the key thing, right? So really centerpiece in our understanding of the genome are the genes and very well characterized the protein coding ones, okay? So that's the starting point. If you want to annotate variants with respect to what functional element in the genome they overlap with and potentially disrupt. Uh, I mean, of course, there are other interesting things that are biologically active. There are regulatory sequences where transcription factor uh, bind, transcription factors bind, where chromatin structure modifying factors bind, other factors bind, or there's non-coding RNA that may be only partially characterized, uh, other sequences that have a structural role and they're important as spacers. I mean, our understanding of those elements, their characterization is not that advanced that we can just use them as much as we use genes, right? So focus is primarily on genes for that reason. Um, And what are the types of genes? Well, as I said before, protein coding ones code for proteins. Protein is very different than nucleic acids, right? It's made of amino acids, has a treaty structure, so forth. We know them very well. Lots of biochemistry papers and books on proteins. And then there's non coding, which actually it's better called, in this case, non protein coding. And usually the gene product is an RNA. So you don't eventually produce a product, you stop at the RNA level. And an example of a family that I think is very well characterized at this stage, so you can look at those, are the microRNAs, which are actually very short RNAs, which regulate transcript stability or translability. So they're actually act as regulators at the transcription level, translation level. They're very short. They have a seed that's even shorter only 8 to 12 nucleotides, if I remember correctly. That seed is highly con conserved, okay? So this is an example of a non-protein coding gene that's worth looking at because it's well understood. But there are others that are still in the process of being discovered, characterized, so forth. So uh, I'm going to focus on the protein coding genes. And then, of course, the other distinction that we mentioned before is um, different functional relevance. So some of these uh, RNA coding genes may be well characterized and they have an important role. Some of them may be more iffy, that may be more redundant, and maybe not strictly required for a perfect function. So the other piece is mapping to different parts in a gene. And here we're using a relatively simple breakdown in parts. We have UTRs that are transcribed but not translated sequences. Then we have the translated coding axons, which are the ones that have a one-to-one, -one, well, one-to-one, three-to-one mapping to the protein sequence from the start to the end column. Okay, three nucleotides, one amino acid. These are also spliced in when you have the pre-mRNA, then it matures through the splicing process, spliced in. Some of them may be spliced out, but typically they're spliced in. And then we have the introns, which do not code for the amino acids, might have regulatory sequences, and are spliced out. And then we have the splice sites, which are these small sites around the intron exon junctions to drive the splicing process. Okay? So this is the breakdown that we will use, and I have some graphics later. And then we'll have upstream, downstream of the transcribed portion of the gene. And then when we get really far, we have intergenic, and ANOVAR will give you a distance to the two closest genes, and that, that gives you really far. Uh, may affect those genes or not. It's difficult to tell. So it's a very gene-centric gene view, of course. 
So I'm going to anticipate this slide. This is a representation that you will see in the UCSC browser, a bit simplified. Transcription starts here. You have the UTR, have the coding accent, big infant, another coding accent, small infant, another coding accent, another coding accent, UTR. This is where the splicing happens. Okay? And then overlapping this gene, which is product coding, I place here a small uh, non-protein non coding, a non-coding RNA that's shorter and of course doesn't have any coding region because it cannot code for proteins. So it's all represented in the same markup of the UTR. Okay, so the tool that we're going to use, ANOVAR, has to make decisions when we have overlapping things, right? If things do not overlap, well, we have that categorization. Every variance get assigned to one category. Unfortunately, in some places of the genome, we have overlaps, right? Especially now, the more non-protein coding RNAs are getting discovered. Some of them maybe are iffy, but they end up overlapping with protein coding genes. So either the annotation tool will tell you everything, this overlaps this, 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 and that, which may confuse you or give you too much information, or it has to make choices, focus on more important stuff, right? ANOVAR prefers to focus on more important stuff. And we need to be aware on what ANOVAR believes to be more important. So that's why this slide is about ANOVAR's priority system, which is unique to the tool in a sense. But you see that this kind of decisions may be made by other tools. It's a general strategy. So it's worth uh, keeping it in mind. And this is specifically to resolve overlaps between different categories. And number one is exonic and splicing, right? Because if you alter coding exon, you can alter the protein sequence. If you alter a splice site, you can alter the splicing and then alter the protein sequence. And then non-protein coding RNA and cRNA comes number two. So in that case before, we have a coding exon overlapping a non-coding RNA. The non-coding exon gets priority. You will not know anything about the non-coding and as we walk down, the two UTRs, 3' prime and 5', prime, introns, and then upstream, downstream, and interject, right? Biologically, this overall makes sense. Uh, maybe for some non-coding RNA, you want to keep them in mind anyway. But. And then I have a slide here with the breakdown that ANOVAR will do for the case that we looked at before. So we'll have upstream here, 5' prime UTR here, exonic, which means exonic protein coding here. Then we have plus 2, minus 2 around the exon intron junction as splicing. Particularly the intronic part would be splicing, and the exonic part would be exonic splicing. Then we have the intron, and then so forth. I didn't plot the splice sites again, just not to have too much clutter. And then see here, when you have an intron and a non-coding RNA overlapping, it will go to non-coding RNA. But when, then when you have a protein-coding exon and a non-coding uh, RNA overlapping, it will go to the protein-coding exon and so forth. <coughs> so here I've taken the ANOVAR output with respect to the gene part and gene mapping, okay? And then I've added the screenshot from the UCSC mapping that variant and then zooming out. This is from the uh, annotated variants that we were uh, making the lab, right? So this is an example of something that's intergenic. You can see that the closest genes are the two extremes. You can see the, the same notation that I used before for the genes with the very thin lines representing introns and then thick lines representing UTRs and bigger block, blocks representing coding axons. And ANOVAR gives you the distance from the two. And then you can see uh, upstream of the transcription, start side of the gene. And then you can see a UTR. This is the three prime UTR, so at the end of the gene the gene is transcribed in this direction. 
And then you can see F5 prime in here. It's in this direction, so it's in the very beginning of the gene. It does overlap the in front of another isoform of the same gene. So here we start seeing a little bit more complexity. We have one gene that's KC and AB2, but that gene has multiple transcript isoforms. So there are different star sites that are reported. This is a shorter isoform, so it starts from here with its own UTR. And actually, this UTR overlaps the intron of other transcript sequences. And Anovar is making a choice and telling you it overlaps the UTR, and not telling you that it's overlapping the intron, of course, in that field. The gene is the same. It's always KC and AD2. And then we have typical sonic coding, protein coding. And then we have a splicing, uh, sorry, neutronic and the splice. Okay. So the, this splicing, I wanted to just elaborate a little bit. If you look at the nucleotide sequence, which unfortunately on this uh, screen view is lower resolution, but you would see that here the nucleotides are AG. AG is a canonical sequence for an acceptor site on the intronic side, okay? And this is changing the G. So, if you look at that in different species, that site is actually very conservative. So changing that G may actually have an impact on the splicing, but functionally you have to check what happens. This is just tipping you, but that may be interesting. Okay, so splice sites is something to Really, not to oversimplify, Anovar has a relatively simplistic look over them. It's just giving you the plus minus two around uh, the intron exon junction. The intronic side is far more important. You have to keep in mind how well conserved they are because if you see a lot of divergence, it's less likely to really be uh, effective. If it's on the exonic side, it's less likely to be effective. So, splice invariants are really tipping you about the fact that it may alter the splicing, but don't take it as a Truth with the capital T, right? Uh, if you see cases where it's on the intronic side, it's an AG, the AG gets disrupted, the AG is well conserved, there is no AG in proximity. That's a good evidence. Other cases, more iffy, right? In this case, I pulled out again from UCSC, all the 46 multi species alignment, it's always AG, right? So, unless you have a gap or the sequence is not there. So this is an AG that's probably functionally important. Right? So we've already learned also about the conservation criteria that I will review more in detail later. And last but not least, what other ways did I use for this gene and gene part annotation? Strong preference and our strong preference as a group is towards RefSeq because it's pretty conservative, meaning that it will give you reasonable <laughs> transcript isoforms, whereas we find the ensemble to be a bit less conservative, so it will give you also isoforms that we not always believe. Uh, UCSC known genes is also, is also pretty good. Uh, all these are available within ANOVAR. If you want others, you'll have to make the database yourself, but you can follow the instructions to do it. Um, if you have a cancer sample, you start looking in the coding regions and you really focus on the variants that are in this sense easier to interpret, RefSeq will, will do a great job. Uh, if you're really trying to scrap anything possible out of a sample, then you may want to try other databases. That's sort of the take home message. And then, of course, I didn't talk about other annotation features within protein coding genes, like protein domains, outside uh, or in proximity or overlapping UTRs. The ENCODE project has produced a lot of profiles uh, for epigenetic marks, like histone marks, where histone reside, the histone is changed, and then it binds to that site in the genome. So if you lose a binding site, that may alter the chromatin regulation. Um, 
So in fact, you have the mark on a protein mapped to the gene, the binding site in the genome of that protein. And then DNA methylation, which occurs directly on the DNA in the CPG islands and other, uh, elsewhere, has a repressive, usually a repressive effect. Again, if you lose, completely lose a site or alter it in a relevant way, you may have an effect, so forth. But these are more difficult to interpret. So if you have something that rules out more than half of a protein, it's much easier to interpret than this. If you have something that disrupts a canonical uh, acceptor site, AG, it, even then it's more easy to interpret than this. So that's why I left it out, besides the fact that we only have two hours. But be aware. Also, these things are all visualizable in UCSC. So you can uh, go on, uh, on a rabbit, show me everything, chase on UCSC. But it will be more difficult to assess what is well. So keeping the pace, um, next thing that we look at is the gene product effect type. Right? I think this was already, to some, at least to some extent, addressed in previous uh, lectures. Uh, here, really, we're going to hone in in the effect of the protein sequence for protein coding genes. Uh, I mean, this type of gene product effect, there may be models that do it also for other categories of RNAs, but again, didn't have enough time. Um, for instance, if you disrupt the seed of a microRNA, you may predict some sort of effect. Uh, what's really established and used by many uh, in the bioinformatics communities for protein coding sequences, you also have tools for other uh, non-protein coding genes. Okay. So this classification of effects is really protein coding centered. Um, Stop gain, coding sequence, you are the stop codon, ribosome arrives, stops. Ah, you haven't translated all the protein. So now you have one copy that's truncated. If it's really truncated, maybe even degraded, you're not going to even see the protein, right? If it's homozygous stop gain at the beginning of the protein, you may not see the protein at all. Frame shift, similar effect, but instead of telling the ribosome to stop, changes the reading frame. So now the ribosome is getting the wrong amino acids from one point down. Similar effect. The difference is mostly in the fact that that arises from an SMV, that arises from an indel. SMVs are easier to detect. Indels are more difficult to detect, especially the somatic ones. So be aware of artifacts. When you ran Strelka, you got only the somatic SMV. So in the lab, we won't see the frame shift. Uh, splicing potentially alters uh, splicing. In fact, we can, it's better to state that alters key sites guiding splicing. Okay, this is the law, your definition of what ANOVA is giving you or the typical annotation tool is giving you. Uh, so you have to do some follow up. Don't believe it necessarily that the splicing is altered and it's a disaster of the problem. Nonetheless, those three get grouped as loss of function mutations, meaning that they need to pretty massive uh, effect with the caveat that if you have of course a loss of function in the end of the protein so you have a stop gain in the end of the protein that removes five amino acids that's not a big effect right unless you're really removing a signal peptide or something so keep that in mind um, then you have the insertions additions that are in frames so remove a one or more amino acids insert one or more amino acids Stop loss, you lose a stop codon. We don't really have, at least that I'm aware of, uh, tools to score these. They're not as disruptive as the ones above. They have some effect. Let's keep them in the middle tier. There are not so many anyway. Right? And then you have the missense SMVs, a lot of them. right? They change an amino acid. How is that relevant? Well, besides going back to the amino acid table and simply looking at the alignments in UCSC, there are models that are used to score these amino acid changes, which I will go through. And then last but not least, synonymous changes. These don't change amino acid. However, I have a slide telling you that even these may actually have an effect. But it's really the, the end of the tier. So again, if you're scrubbing 
for anything possible. Look at the synonymous. Otherwise, you have already plenty of work stopping here. In fact, we will not try to interpret the synonymous ones in the lab. Sometimes a ribosome has the ability to correct yeah. the premature. Yeah. Even, even a stop gain uh, needs to be validated functionally, right? Yeah. So if you can detect the protein at the full level, the stop gain is not really functional. So. So, for instance, if you are using complete genomics data and you have SMV reference SMV, those will be grouped in a block substitution, and then the effect uh, may not be a synonymous change. I don't know if that was what you uh, you were saying. Or if you were saying just combination of multiple SMVs at different points. Because if you have multiple SMVs at different points, again, they will not change the protein sequence, but they may have effects going in other directions. What's in the slide that I haven't shown you yet? It's basically that they may change uh, a regulatory sequence that's overlapping the coding sequence, but actually controls splicing or something else. So in the end, again, conservation, right? You have a synonymous that's stellar conservation in all so many species. It's not changing the amino acid, but it might be doing something else. You have a few of those, cluster, it's not an artifact. They're all conserved, all synonymous, even more evidence. I don't have any case in mind where I saw that, but others may have seen that. So, But it's more something like an exotic uh, thing rather than what you see, the, the, uh, the bread and butter, basically. So do you think that we should be reporting synonymous and like intronic mutations and stuff even though we don't uh, have Who's gonna read the report? <laughs> because if you are in the clinic and you're reporting it to the patient, you're gonna drive the patient crazy. Well, maybe for instance, right? So depending on the community, yeah. if you have say that you, you're trying to interpret the biology of a cancer, start from the top. Sure, yeah. If you can squeeze out something out of this level, great but it's going to be a lot of effort compared to the amount of success that you can get out of it, right? Well, I'm just thinking more for me. Like, I always just ignore those ones. So, so if we were in the oil industry, those are the, that's the oil in Saudi Arabia, and these are the tar sands. Now, in Alberta, they know how to use them uh, with environmental effects. But, I mean, uh, it's not something to completely forget about, but practically, we often forget about them when we look through violence, so... If there are great tools surfacing that really are able to take a thousand synonymous variants and find the one that's relevant, I'm not aware of tools that do such a great job right now. They may appear in the future, especially in relation to splicing in answers. That's, a, that's something to uh, stay tuned on. If there will be tools that actually tell you this synonymous is actually disrupting a splicing in answer, that may be a, a great thing to look at. Yeah, that, that's, but in that case, you're not trying to assess the effect of the variant. You're just looking at basically the general mechanics of the mutation mechanism in the cancer. So, what, I mean, you know, one thing I've seen is, is translatability, right? Can you look at codon usage? Codon, codon usage, codon yes. Uh, I'm personally not an expert. Uh, I never had a chance to uh, practically use codon usage, but in the slide that I haven't shown, the other point besides, say, uh, cryptic regulatory sequence is actually called on usage. Right. Uh, but I don't have any tool to actually suggest right now to look at that, but it's in general, just from the biological, theoretical point of view, is something to keep in mind. So this is meant as, where do we start from? Where do we move to? What's more difficult to look at? I'm not saying anything should go in the garbage right away and never be looked at. Uh, okay, so I've already covered this. Uh, the key really here is, well, one, on the one hand, you will always better off if you do a functional validation with a loss of function variant at the 
uh, gene product is not there, or is there in a reduced amount, of course, or is there in a truncated form, okay? So Western blots, stuff like that. Uh, but what you can already do bioinformatically is look at the percentage of the protein that's affected, and if there are multiple isoforms, right, you may have a stop gain that's taking away 50% of one isoform but not another. And then what are the roles played by, played by the isoform? And then you have to do more mining. You cannot just know it directly from the databases. Um, well, splicing, I already tipped you about the complexities. The annotation that you get from Manovar is relatively simplistic. Um, and frame shift, interestingly, not only they can be a false positive because in the coding is more difficult, but they may be rescued by another frame shift. So if you have your variants, you sort them by position and by gene, you can see that if a gene has multiple frame shifts, one may actually uh, correct the other one, meaning that you only have a, a piece of the protein sequence where the frame was incorrect and then th that's rescued down the way. Although if you have genes with a lot of frame shift, I mean, maybe your uh, tumor sample is really wild, but if there's a lot of frame shifts also in the general reference databases looking at general invariants, this gene may be under very weak constraint, may be less likely to produce a phenotype, gene lab information. But. Okay, so we're moving towards the last piece, which is how do we assess missense variants? So, key question is, how does a missense alter protein function after it changes an amino acid? And biologically, before then bioinformatically, it's different ideas of how you may look at that. Well, what's the type of amino acid change? As we said before, we go from a polar to hydrophobic, positive, negative charge, a proline, which has its own uh, constraint over the, the bending angle and so forth, to another amino acid, or vice versa. Uh, how big is the side chain, just looking at the size and so forth. Another key thing is conservation across species of the genomic sequence, which codes for that amino acid. Uh, of course, you'll see that the third nucleotide is usually less conserved, of course, because it doesn't change uh, the amino acid necessarily. But you'll see that different positions over the coding sequence have different levels of conservation, I have examples of it. And then there's also conservation across different protein sequences at the amino acid level, which is actually used by the scoring models that I will talk about later. So here, conservation can have different meanings. But the most intuitive one is conservation at the genomic level, if you just compare the nucleotide sequences across so many species after doing a multiple alignment, as we saw before for the AG site on the splicing site. It overlaps a conserved protein domain. That's another thing. Uh, it overlaps a sequence that creates a secondary protein structure. You may even have the 3D protein structure and be able to do some sort of extrapolation from that, although not for all proteins. You may have annotated functional features from databases like SwissProt and then take that into account. So these are all biologically what we should be looking at, right? Then we have tools that have a specific model that look at one or more of those properties, combine them together, either, either use a theoretical model of how, how things are supposed to look like in nature, or they use a machine learning model that's a big, big black box where you use a training set and then that big black box gets internally wired to emulate what it has seen. And then you get a prediction output. In this course, we'll try to put some light into the inner workings of these models with one slide each. <laughs> but you already uh, had a chance maybe to read the paper that was in the background readings on mutation assessor, which also gives you a good overview in the introduction of what are the strategies used by these tools. <clears throat> well, this is the example that we saw before on a very evident change in the amino acid associated with the pathogenic allele and a very moderate change associated with a non-pathogenic allele that's also present in the general population and is not somatic, or not strictly somatic. 
Um, and well, we've already discussed this, okay? So I wasn't lying, it was actually in the slide. Current usage and uh, quickly regulatory uh, sequences such as splicing and answers. And I mean, the easiest heuristic in the end for this is very strong conservation at the genomic DNA nucleotide level, right? If you see an outstanding conservation, uh, that can tip you out. And then there's probably more complex models coming out in the future, for instance, for uh, splicing enhancers. Before we move into the models for scoring emissions variants, well, let's not forget about zygosity, right? Variants come in uh, homozygous ones, heterozygous ones. You can have loss of uh, heterozygosity in cancer, so in fact that heterozygous is on the only, only copy left of the gene. Uh, the fact that you can, for instance, kill both uh, genes on the two homologous uh, chromosomes rather than only kill one means you don't have any gene product at all. So the zygosity is, not, is an orthogonal criterion, but seeing a homozygous stop of gain or a heterozygous stop of gain can make, make a lot of difference. Right? Or seeing two stop gains at different positions, if you can show they are on a different phase, so they're killing the two different copies of the gene can make a lot of difference, right? Sometimes in cancer, you may see that there's a previous step that's, le that's more benign that has one stop gain, and then a more, a less benign stage, which that stop gain has become homozygous, or there's another one on the other copy, maybe on P53 or on RB1, stuff like that. So, zygosity is a, is a thing not to forget. And don't forget that eximeos comes on in one copy. So outside of the so-called pseudo-autosomal regions, screw up the copy, you're done. OK, we are pretty much in time. Uh, in the last five, 10 minutes before the lab, we're going to look at conservation and missing variant scoring models. I will sell you a specific conservation uh, scoring model, let's go follow P. And then we arrive through three different models for missiles effect scoring. Mutation assessor was in the paper that was in the readings. SIP and polyphen two are very, very, very broadly used. Okay, conservation. Well, we already had plenty of time to discuss conservation as an idea. Uh, in general, it's used a lot in bioinformatics. It's a very powerful idea in biology. If all the species need something, it must be doing something. That's the boil down heuristic, right? Uh, of course, there may be genes that have evolved specifically in uh, mammalians or specifically in humans. Many of those actually control the, as you may imagine, the brain architecture and neuron dynamics. Fortunately for cancer, uh, we don't have so many genes that are unique to humans, so you can solidly trust uh, multi-species conservation. Um, we can look at conservation at the nucleotide on the level, on the genomic sequence. We can look at it comparing protein sequences, even if the proteins don't come from the same genomic locus. In this section, I will focus on the one at the genomic level, so aligning different genomic sequences so that their nucleotides overlap. Um, and if you look at UCSC, uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, browser and all the backend data, and you're interested in the nucleotide level conservation, there's the phylopy score, which scores every single position for conservation, looking at substitution rates and using a model this, to decide if that's close to the neutral substitu substitution rate or if that residue is conserved. And then there's the FASCONS score, which is what? Well, it's done by writing through these phylopy scores across the genome and then checking if you're seeing a high concentration of high phylopy scores and then it's telling you, oh, not only the single residues are conserved, this interval overall is conserved. And this is not based on some silly, just averaging by a uh, fixed window. It's based on a hidden Markov model for people who are with a computer science background. So it's sophisticated enough. 
uh, we're not really going to use this because this is more useful. When you write out of the protein coding genes, it's useful in telling you, is this sequence, not just single position, but sequence, conserved? Is it a conserved element? Uh, maybe regulatory or doing something? Uh, here, since we focus on protein coding sequence, we're really going to use the fallopian. So at the single residue to assess missense variants. And then always useful to take a look at the multi-species alignment available in UCSC. So for instance, we did it before when we looked at the intronic AG that controls splicing. This is just a screenshot showing you those tracks. The uh, phylo P is available for uh, vertebrate, mammalian, and uh, primates. Cancer, you can look at the vertebrate, maybe the mammalian. Uh, you don't really need to just look at the primates. If you are doing uh, mm -hmm. research on uh, schizophrenia or autism, sometimes looking at the primates is interesting. And then you also have the fast cone score. You can see that the fast cones doesn't come in uh, roller coasters as tight as the fallopy, but it usually comes in big blocks that are either cold or not cold, meaning that you have elements that are conserved or so intervals that are conserved or not conserved, right? So you can imagine the hidden Marco model writing through the single fallopy scores and then deciding if it's seeing a stretch that's conserved or not conserved. But you can see a relation that where you have less density of a high fallopy, like here with more dips, the fast cones drop. And when you have a stretch of fallopy that's high, fast cone rises. You may wonder why you have that repeating pattern where you, one of the three fallopy is low. That's because of cotons, the third nucleotide, uh, can be changed without changing the amino acid. You can see that in the final P score. It's all over the place. Okay, so I've already uh, briefly sketched uh, what the final P does, and the score comes from a statistical test to detect if nucleotide substitution rates are faster or slower than expected under neutral drift. So you have a model in which something is not constrained, can just change randomly without producing an effect, uh, <coughs> which is the um, neutral drift. And then if something is changing faster than that throughout the phylogeny, that's accelerated evolution. And if it's constrained, it's changing less than expected, and that's conservation. So I've given you a very simple and boiled down to, to the minimum explanation. I'm probably a quantitative genetics person who killed me, but that's the idea to bring home. Uh, here, of course, we're not interested in things that have accelerated evolution. We're interested in conserved things. As a proxy of that position is really important. It cannot widely change and nothing changes. Um, <coughs> it's available only where aligned sequences are available. It's usually not a big deal for uh, pr protein coding exons. Maybe a deal when you move out in the genome that you may have stretches that are unique to humans or only human and chimp. And as you see it on the UCSC browser, conserved is usually greater than 2. Or you can be less stringent and take greater than 1.5, or you can be more stringent and take greater than 2.5. In the ANOVAR database that we will use, we will get a score that's slightly different, but I have details on how to back convert that into these scales. This is the master scale. It's actually coming from a transformate of the p-value of the statistical test. And zero is neutral, and then negative is diverge. So it's either uh, not under conservation, it has diverged a lot, uh, might be accelerated evolution, but here really interesting in the fact that if you have a change there, it's, it's very little likelihood to be interesting as a driver. Right, moving towards the end. I've already given you an overview of this other models uh, scoring missense variance. The key things to keep in mind is what features they use, and then do they use a theoretical model or do they use machine learning? And finally, what data set is used to assess their performance, or if it's a machine learning model, to train them. Because you can imagine you have so many features how do you decide which missions are actionable or not? If you're using sets of non missions that produce an alteration, there are many ways to define that. If you use variants that you think don't produce an alteration, there are many ways of defining that. So there's really a lot of 
interpreting biologically what choices were made constructing the tool that you have to keep in mind. The most the tool that's been around for the longest time that's become most popular, it's called SIFT. It was published first in 2001, so it's more than 10 years ago, which in genomics is almost prehistoric. Um, it's designed specifically for uh, with deleterious mutation in mind, so mutation that degrade the capacity of the protein to function. It's not really designed, for instance, for uh, activating mutation, which are as interesting in cancer. Like, that doesn't mean that it will do a disaster of a job in, for activating mutation. It just may work less well. And the idea is one, and relatively simple. The idea is you take the protein sequence, you take similar protein sequences using a side blast, and then you come up with a score, which, is simil which uses a framework similar to the uh, Blossom matrices, uh, position-specific substitution matrices, Define a probability to see a given amino acid in that panel of protein sequences that are related. Normalize that, and then you get a score that if you see a given amino acid that's different than the, the typical one in the protein, how likely that is to be disruptive. So it's just taking so many protein sequences that are similar, aligning them, looking at how many times the alternative amino acid is absorbed maybe zero times, so in that case you just have the so-called pseudo counts, which is a minimal background count. And then based on that, it's saying, mm, this is potentially damaging. So it's just looking in nature for the other protein sequences, how they are constructed. If you always have a given sequence of amino acids in, in a protein domain, and the protein domain is relatively well conserved, and you have so many proteins, and then all of a sudden, puff, instead of a glycine, you get a problem, this should be good at telling you that that's not going to work out, right? But you need to have, of course, so many protein alignments. And then there's a cutoff that people usually use that's also proposed as default. If you're below that, something is supposed to be damaging. But really, this is using one idea. Taking protein sequences, aligning them using side blast, and then looking for how many times you will serve an alternative uh, amino acid using that specific probability model. How distant species do they use? Uh, no, I don't remember if they use all vertebrates or even more, but I mean, side blast at some point will not take in sequences that are too diverged. So. But if we can find something that's still use it, yeah. it's going to be distant. Yeah. And there is a 2009 set. Yeah, no, 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 I mean, uh, I didn't mean to say that they published in 2001 and then they stopped doing anything, yeah. but you can see that the idea is simple and it came out a long time ago and then it was not revolutionized from the ground up. You can see more recent tools bringing in a lot more stuff, right? Because there's publication Stratify. And that's Polyphen 2, basically, it has many more uh, features. In fact, I didn't even list them. Sequence-based, structure-based. Um, and this is a typical machine learning model. So it's using all these features. Some of them may be more informative, some of them less informative. And then it's using two different uh, training sets. Now, I'll just spend a minute on this. In this one, that's more stringent, you use damaging alleles, non-Mendelian disorders. And then you use uh, protein alignments from human to other mammalian homologs as a negative. This is less stringent because you use all human disease causing mutations and non synonymous uh, SNPs without disease association. So that starts to give you an idea of the kind of cho choices that you have to make. In the mutation assess uh, assessor paper, what they really point out, the big deal with these machine learning based models is if most of your variants disease associated come from Mendelian uh, disorders where loss of function missions are more common or certain types of missions are more common, different than cancer, then the performance for cancer may be less good, right? So it's worth using polyphen also for cancer, but it may not be the best tool ever. And then the last one, so we keep in time, is mutation assessor, which uses, again, an evolutionary idea that's similar to SIFT, but extends it, taking into account that you don't only look at conservation across 
a set of sequences that are similar, but you take into account if a subset of those sequences that form a family actually have a very high conservation. So it's basically improving a bit over the SIFT model, but again, the idea is strongly based on uh, amino acid conservation within protein sequence. And then it's not using machine learning. It's just using a theoretical probabilistic model based on entropy. What's interesting is that they benchmarked it against it's polymorphisms, and then somatic mutations present in cosmic. Now, what's really uh, I find striking is that these different curves, this is a polymorphic one, which is basically telling you that if you, uh, say, are here with a score of 1, you get about 50% of the polymorphisms, and if you take 4, you got basically nothing. You can see the shifts in this curve, meaning that at high values of the score, you get a lot of them. This is if you increase the cutoff on how many times a somatic mutation needs to be absorbing cosmic. And this is five or more times. So as you become more stringent on this is being reported for multiple samples, multiple studies, uh, it's more likely to be true just using a frequency, true and relevant using a frequency uh, base criterion, and nothing else, you can see that mutation assessor does a better job. Right? So that's it for the front lectures, and we're only 10 minutes late.